Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to our Adult Education Society seminar series. Today, we are very excited to have Michelle with us as our speaker. Um, Michelle is an associate professor of data science and operations at the USC Marshall, Marshall School of Business. Um, his research focuses on data-driven decision-making optimization, particularly in settings where data are scarce, such as the applications that rely on personalization and uh, real-time decision-making. So his research spans a wide variety of areas, including revenue management, education, healthcare, and AI. Uh, Vishal completed his PhD in operations research at MIT in 2014, and he has received a number of recognitions for his work, including the Wagner Prize for Excellence in the Practice of Advanced Analytics and Operations Research, the prestigious Pierre Scala Best Paper Prize, uh, the Jack the Chef Impact of Research and Practice Award. Michelle, uh, thank you again for joining us uh, today and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you to Haas and to Said and to Shui about, uh, for the invitation to come present. Um, as was mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about Project AVA, which was our collaboration with the Greek government to design and deploy their COVID-19 testing system back in the summer of 2020. Um, I'm very casual as a speaker. So if you have questions as we go along, please, I don't know exactly how the webinar works. I guess drop them in the Q&A or the chat or do something. Um, but this work is also joint with my two amazing co-authors, Hamza Bastani, who's at Wharton, and Kimon Drakopoulos, who's also at USC. So to get started, um, I need to take us back in time back to before the summer of 2020. So a lot has happened in the pandemic since then. Uh, but if you think back to before, like, I don't know, March, April of 2020, you have to remember that back then there were no vaccines available. So when we were thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic, contact tracing and quarantining were our primary tools. Um, moreover, this was back when testing was scarce. So at that point in time, the accuracy of rapid tests or antigen testing was unclear. There was some sense that it was something like a 60% sensitivity um, specificity. And so everyone was looking at PCR uh, testing, but PCR testing required specialized machinery, right? And there was a fixed limited number of these machines and everyone around the globe was trying to scale up their testing protocol. Um, so it was estimated there was a three to six month lead time for new machines. And then I'll just say like, if you're thinking back to before summer of 2020, I would say it's fair to say that the epidemiological knowledge about COVID-19 was still evolving. So there were still fundamental questions about transmission. So this is a picture of somebody washing their groceries. I don't know if other people did this. This was back when we thought maybe the virus was transmitted by contaminated surfaces. We were all washing groceries. There was also a lot of questions about how long um, patients might remain pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic once infected, but still contagious. So a lot of uncertainty around this. Okay, and I'd say back at the same time, uh, while this is happening with the pandemic, COVID-19 is just ravaging the global economy. So I'm focusing here on tourism, uh, but the estimates at the time were that the pandemic could cost something like a trillion dollars to the tourism sector, right? Or something like one to 2% of global GDP or something like hundred million jobs, right? So just to give a sense of this, in the first six months of 2020 alone, we saw a 65% drop in global tourism. So for countries like Greece, this was a huge hit to their economy because they were fundamentally driven by tourism. And this raises a question, right? So I think this was the question that we were asked, which was that how do we support safe travel amidst the pandemic um, in these contexts? And I just wanna say that I, I framed this question in sort of tourism, but you should think about travel here more generally, right? So if you think about an economic entity like the European Union, the European Union is predicated on the idea that we can ship goods and labor freely across national borders. So if you can't support safe travel, um, it's the pandemic, these sorts of economic entities just sort of crumble. All right, so this was the backdrop um, in which we started talking to Greece. Um, and so at that time, we met with Greece, we started talking about uh, what they were looking for. And a couple of goals emerged uh, in those initial conversations. So the first thing that emerged was some quantitative goals, which was that Greece wanted to build a system uh, that would allow them to estimate COVID-19 prevalence across many different traveler subpopulations. So they had already engaged in a pretty stringent lockdown within the country. So the number of COVID-19 cases inside country was deemed pretty low 
but they were concerned about opening up their borders and importing cases, right? So their first goal was, we'd like to understand what is the risk across different traveler subpopulations where you can interpret traveler subpopulation as uh, men between the ages of 30 and 40 coming to Greece from uh, California in the US. And at the same time, uh, given that we had this like limited testing ability, this limited number of machines, they wanted to allocate those scarce testing resources to the highest risk subpopulations. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the reinforcement learning literature, I think you'll see these two quantitative goals and immediately recognize this as an exploration exploitation trade-off, right? So in order to estimate COVID-19 prevalence across many different populations, you have to explore, you have to test broadly. But at the same time, if you want to allocate to the highest risk populations, you have to exploit, you have to test very narrowly in these higher risk populations. And it's true that in today, I'm going to present to you a reinforcement learning algorithm that's at the heart of the AVA system that balances this exploration exploitation trade-off. But that said, before we do that, I do want to highlight that a couple of qualitative goals also emerged in these conversations. So the first was that any system that we built would have to be able to communicate insights to stakeholders for other pandemic operations, right? So we were primarily concerned with this notion of screening travelers coming to Greece, but these estimates might be used by other portions of the government, for example, to inform social distancing measures or smart contact tracing. Um, and you can say that, well, how do you do that? In most uh, healthcare ops uh, operations, we're kind of familiar with this need. And so we do things like develop really great decision support tools and visualizations. We sit down with these stakeholders and have these conversations. Um, this is a picture of Kimon speaking with the Prime Minister of Greece. But I want to say that more fundamentally, this qualitative goal informed the way we thought about these quantitative goals. So our strategy in designing this system was always to put at the forefront transparent reasoning and design a system that supported human the loop decision making. So we could leverage a lot of the expertise from our epidemiological and physician co-authors, especially given the rampant uncertainty around the way that the virus worked. So in today, I'm gonna to talk a lot about this transparent reasoning and um, simplicity, right? I'm not gonna talk so much about optimality. Our goal here wasn't to build an algorithm that is somehow mathematically precisely optimal for these quantitative goals. It was rather to build something that would engender a lot of buy-in in a high, moment of crisis among potentially non-technical stakeholders. Okay, so um, what are we gonna talk about today? I have no attachment to doing all of these slides. So if there are questions that come up and we detour, that's great. Um, but I'll give you a rough overview of the AVA system um, and what it's doing. And then I'm gonna deep dive into two elements of it, um, in particular, designing the testing supply chain and this reinforcement learning perspective. And then we'll wrap up the talk, um, talking a little bit about the measured impact of AVA. Okay, no questions yet. All right, so let's talk about what is the system? All right, so this is AVA. Uh, it was as it was run between August 6th and November 1st of 2020. Okay, so if you wanted to visit Greece in this time frame, what would happen? You would first go online and you would fill out what's called a passenger locator form or a PLF form. Um, and this had to be filled out at least 24 hours prior to arriving in Greece. And that PLF form would solicit certain basic demographic information. So things like your age, um, your how many people are traveling in your party, what countries have you been in the last 14 days? What is your itinerary in Greece? Where do you plan to arrive? Things like that. And based on that information, Ava would look at you and would decide whether or not you should be tested or not tested upon arrival. So if you arrived and you were flagged for no testing, you would just go on with your vacation and have a great time in Greece. And if you were flagged for testing, there would be a medical personnel who would meet you at the border, um, collect a biological sample, and then ask you to self-quarantine for 24 to 48 hours. In that time, that sample would be sent to a lab where it would be processed on one of those machines. And then the result would be update, uploaded to a central database. And then information from this central database, uh, if you were positive, for example, would be sent to other downstream teams that might do smart contact tracing or things like this. Uh, but for our purposes, the information from that central database is then pseudonymized and aggregated and fed back to Ava. And this is where we see that reinforcement learning piece, right? So Ava is then gonna use these testing results 
to optimize its testing allocations and produce risk estimates for tomorrow. So the choices that it made about who to test today will influence which data it has available tomorrow. Okay, so this is the overall system. Um, what I want to, I think, when you see this system and when I talk about it, I think if you're like me and you're an AI person, you're immediately drawn to this arrow, this reinforcement learning piece, and you want to like, well, what is going on there? How are you doing this? But before we get there, I kind of really want to stress that Ava is more than just a reinforcement learning algorithm, right? So if we zoom out a bit, um, you'll realize that to actually build this loop, you have to solve a variety of ops and supply chain problems, okay? So just as a quick example, um, here I said, for example, after you're tested, your biological sample is sent to a lab, okay? But if you really think about it, uh, this is a little bit more complicated. There are something like 40 or 41 points of entry to Greece, like land borders, seaports, uh, airports, uh, all over the country. Some of them are on very remote islands. Um, and then all of the labs that do this processing tend to be congregated around the big cities, mostly around Athens. So in order to send this biological sample, you need a way to safely transport it quickly from the airport or point of entry to this lab and you need to do this quickly because you need to again turn around the processing time in 24 to 48 hours because as you're doing it this person is self-quarantined so there is a question about how do you design the supply chain that right? the supply chain that moves biological samples to labs that needs to be solved similarly i said earlier that you know when you if you wanted to go to greece you would go online and fill out this plf form but he actually had to sit down with lawyers to design this PLF form, right? So there's a question about what information should the form solicit? On the one hand, you want information that's potentially epidemiologically relevant to whether or not you have uh, COVID. But on the other hand, there are certain questions that if I asked would be deemed uh, too private, too sensitive information to be soliciting from you. So we had to sit down with GDPR lawyers and sort of navigate this trade-off. Um, there's other things going on here, like this pseudonymized aggregated arrow that I pointed to earlier. I said, okay, we have we only take the aggregated data, there's some GDPR compliance going on here. Um, there's some database questions about how to do this. I don't want to you know, belabor the point, but what I want to say is that uh, this application, uh, like most applications of real world AI, depends on some interweaving between OR modeling and AI, right? And so in some sense, if you want this to be successful, uh, you can't just do one piece or the other, right? So the success of one piece really crucially depends on the design of the other, right? So the AI will not work well, reinforcement learning will not work well unless information travels around this loop in a quick, robust, fast way. But you can't get information to travel around this loop in a quick, fast, robust way unless you solve these sort of surrounding supply chain and OR problems, okay? So with that context, right, that is AVA, that's the system. And what I'm going to do is first dive into one of those OR problems, just to give people a sense of what's going on in this testing the supply chain. All right, any questions? It's a good time if someone has a question. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just ask a question. Uh, just curious, why you call it EVA or EVA? Is any this acronym is a for anything? It is not an acronym, and this is a great question. This, this, this name was chosen by Kimon and one of our other co authors, on John Vlachogiannis, who has like, developed many of the databases. And the two of them just insisted that they pick this name. And then nobody else on the team believes that there is no story. But they, if you can get it out of them, go buy Kimon some beers and see if he'll tell you the truth. Okay. Any other questions? Everybody's clear on how the system works, the problem we're trying to solve. All right, so like I said, I'm, I'm first, this is the overall system. The first thing I'm gonna do actually is deep dive into this arrow. So thinking about that testing supply chain. Okay, so again, like I said, on the surface, this seems like a simple thing, just send the biological sample from the point of entry to the lab. How do we think about that? So here is a map. Um, these are the 40 points of entry to Greece. Um, you can ignore the sizes uh, for now. The labs have been omitted from this uh, map for privacy reasons, but it gives you a sense of the scale of the problem, how you have to do this. So if you start thinking about designing this testing supply chain, you realize there are sort of two fundamental questions you first have to answer. And if you can answer these two questions, you can sort of back out all the remaining questions in the supply chain. So the first question you have to answer is that given that I have a finite budget of testing resources, 
how much testing capacity should I assign to each point of entry? So in other words, how many tests do I want to be able to run per day at the Athens airport? Okay. And the second question you have to answer is that if I'm running that many tests per day at the Athens airport, which labs are going to actually process those biological samples? So I have to think about the, the connections between these points of entry and the corresponding labs. And if you can answer these two questions, you can answer all the other sort of downstream supply chain questions. So for example, when you know how many tests to run at the Athens airport, you can sort of back at how many medical personnel do I need in order to support that capacity at the Athens airport. If you know which labs are being served by which points of entry, you can think about how many logistics teams do I need to have, where should they move, and how are they gonna correspond? So as we started talking about this problem, um, and again, this problem is being solved before Ava is deployed, right? We have to build this supply chain before we can deploy the system. Um, so as we're talking about this problem with a lot of the experts in the, the Greek government, some things became clear. So first is they were thinking about this and wanted to think about this as a single shot decision with no recourse. And that's because uh, developing the contracts with the labs about their capacity and with logistics teams about moving things um, was a sticky process. And so like trying to do that twice or change it somewhere in the middle of the summer seemed too difficult. So given that this is now a single shot problem, you can start thinking about modeling this as a mixed binary optimization problem. And I think some of the constraints in this problem become really clear. If you think about it for a few minutes, like, you know, um, as I'm assigning points of entry to labs, the number of biological samples processed at the lab shouldn't exceed the lab's processing capacity. If I'm having this lab process tests from this point of entry, they should be close enough that the logistics teams can move. Uh, between them and given this 24 to 48 hour time frame, you probably want them to be able to go between 12 hours. So you can't have things that are geographically too far away. So I won't go into this. I think this is like a good uh, mixed integer, like first year graduate student uh, exercise to model these sorts of constraints. Uh, what I will say is that there is one sticky point if you're thinking about this sort of, I answer these two questions in an optimization formulation, which is what is the right objectives? And I say objectives because this is very clearly a multi-objective problem. You have many things that you want to achieve. Um, things like minimizing these transportation costs about the logistics teams, um, in some sense, streamlining border operations, right? You don't want to be like uh, having people queuing uh, in very long ways to have these tests being run. And I'm gonna focus on one particular objective that I think is uh, sort of the primary one to think about first, which is that you do wanna design this system so that later, sorry, the supply chain, so that later when we deploy the AVA system, it's able to catch the most number of infected tourists that are trying to enter, enter the country, right? So that's a kind of safety measure. We would like in some sense it to be set up to catch a lot of infections. And this is a little bit subtle because if you think about it, um, tests will ultimately be allocated by our RL algorithm. And that means that there's going to be diminishing marginal returns to assigning capacity. And this is somewhat different than traditional supply chain models. I think when we think about traditional supply chain models, um, you often write these mixed binary problems and you say there's a constant bang for buck. So if I assign another test uh, to the Gathens airport, my likelihood of catching an infection is some fraction, right? Like a 2% chance I catch an infection or something like this. But I claim that in this system, or if you're gonna be downstream allocating by RL, you should expect to see diminishing marginal returns, right? So let me, let me just try to spell that out. So here's a sketched graph. Um, on this graph, I'm thinking about one point of entry. So let's think about the Athens airport. On the X axis, I'm looking at the percent of arrivals tested at the Athens airport. And on the Y axis, I'm thinking about the number of infections you would catch if you tested that many people. So the first thing to notice is that if your RL algorithm is any good and you only have a small number of tests at the Athens airport, you're gonna assign those tests to the riskiest people. And if you assign them to the riskiest people, you expect to find a high number of infections. But then as you start assigning more and more tests to the Athens airport, those subsequent tests have to go to lower risk passengers because you already tested all the risky people. So now you're just testing the leftover people. And so you're gonna get less bang for buck. Okay, and so this is why intuitively you should expect that there should be some diminishing marginal returns on the testing. 
And I just want to really specify this, that you should contrast this to random targeting. If you were doing nothing, like if you weren't using RL algorithm, but you were just picking somebody out of line to test, then the probability that they're positive is the same for everybody and you would see sort of a constant ratio, right? So this is the kind of difference from the classical supply chain modeling of thinking constant bang for buck, sort of well models random targeting. But if we're thinking that we're going to be using an RL algorithm later, we need to capture these diminishing marginal returns. And what's nice is that like uh, this little sketched picture plays out in the data. So this is actual data. I think it's taken from September 1st. Uh, I don't, let's not quote me on that. It's actual data. Um, and I looked at two points of entry. So entry 17 and entry six, which is a relatively risky point of entry and a relatively safe point of entry. So on the left, what I've shown is I've taken each of the passengers that were arriving um, and I bucketed them by the risk that they had COVID-19. So think about this, the probability that they were infected. Um, and then on the y-axis in this histogram is the number of arrivals. Um, and so what you can see is like entry 17 is uh, more risky because there are, you know, for example, some people that are arriving that have like a one in 100 chance of being positive with COVID-19, right? Versus entry six tends to be uh, attracted here. And then on the right side, I've made exactly the same picture I made before. I'll think about if I tested this fraction of arrivals, what is the expected number of infections found? You can actually use this histogram to compute this curve explicitly, uh, if you think about it. Um, and you get these this uh, X'd out graph here on both of them. So the important things to notice is that this is a piecewise linear concave function, right? So that's gonna be helpful later on this optimization formulation. But then more intuitively, there is a dramatic difference between these two graphs, right? So risky entries and safe entries are very different. So this is something I'm going to need to model, right? And so I can't just abstract away this diminishing marginal returns. Okay, there's a question in the chat. Uh, Matthew says, how are you allocating testing resources to continue to explore populations that were low risk, but may not be higher risk? This is a great question, Matthew. So this is gonna um, go back to the, this is gonna be answered in the reinforcement learning piece of this talk. So at this point, we're just building supply chain. I haven't deployed the algorithm. I haven't even told you what the algorithm is gonna do, but you are absolutely correct that when I describe that algorithm, it better do this. It better have this quality you're describing. All right, so everybody's good with this. This is the supply chain. We can represent these piecewise linear concave functions uh, in a tractable way in this mixed binary program and solve them. And we could just have solved this thing and then said, hey, here is the optimal supply chain. But I guess anyone who's worked in practice with multi-objective optimization knows this is a, a terrible idea, right? So what is a better idea? If you think back to those qualitative goals of supporting non-technical decision makers, we thought about this as, okay, we should build a decision support tool, right? And this is based again on this idea that interpretability is sort of more important than optimality, especially in context where most parameters are uncertain. So the tool was meant to help them visualize trade-offs between various costs. So here I just picked two costs to think about. Um, I think about the, the number of links between point of entries and labs. And you can think about this as proportional to the logistics costs, because I'm gonna have dedicated teams that go twice a day. So the number of links sort of determines the number of teams. And then I'm gonna think about number of infections. And what the tool would show is that for example here, I have the number of point of entry lab pairs. So this is uh, the most expensive chain and this is the least expensive chain in terms of transportation costs. And I show how many infections you have and I just rescaled it so that this is one. So the way you can interpret this is that, okay, as I make the chain cheaper, how much am I giving up in terms of infections cost? And then uh, decision makers will be able to look at a graph like this, pick a point um, and then see what the actual chain looked like. And here I've anonymized the geography um, for for uh, privacy reasons, but they would be able to look at these things and say, okay, like, does this make sense? And then leverage some of their own domain expertise in um, these logistics and supply chain ways to pick out a good chain that they, they felt comfortable with across these variety of costs. All right, so that was sort of the, the work that we did before we built, uh, before we actually deployed AVA to build this surrounding testing supply chain, to deploy all the medical personnel, um, at these points of entry, things like this. And then now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and sort of go towards this reinforcement learning question. Before I do that, are there any questions that we've talked about so far? Okay. 
So Matthew, hopefully this will get to your question. If it doesn't, ask again, please. All right, so again, if you're a visual person, take a step back. This is what Ava was doing, right? This is the whole set of Ava. Right now, I'm gonna do a deep dive into this particular arrow, which is this reinforcement learning piece. So thinking about how does Ava use prior testing results to make good decisions about who to test today? Okay, and then the challenge that this is reinforcement learning is that reinforcement learning, it's always these two steps, but they're sort of intermingled, right? So on one side, you want to use the data that you have so far to estimate risks. And then as you estimate risks, you will allocate tests to risky groups. But at the same time, who you allocate tests to today determines what data you have tomorrow. So it again, it will affect the, or your ability to estimate risks tomorrow, right? So this is this fundamental exploration exploitation trade-off. For the purposes of exposition, I'm gonna encourage you to think about these as two separate steps and we'll talk about them as two separate steps. But then you have to remember that like, the actual reinforcement learning algorithm, this is going around and around and around. So first let's talk about estimating prevalence, disease prevalence. So why is this hard? On the one hand, you might say, well, Vishal, you have something like uh, 40,000 arrivals per day to Greece, right? You're testing, um, I think at the peak of the testing season, we were testing something like eight to 10% of them, right? So you have a lot of data in a few days. It should be very easy to estimate disease prevalence. Um, and what I'm gonna say is that actually, if you think about this application, you have a very small amount of relevant data. Okay, so why do I say that? So the first thing is that the typical prevalence in these populations is on the order of one in a thousand. And why is that? It's because these are asymptomatic travelers. In the summer of 2020, if you were coughing, the airline didn't let you get on the plane, you just stayed home. So all the people that are actually arriving at Greece are asymptomatic. So you would expect the prevalence to be sort of low. The second thing, which I think uh, Matthew is getting at in this question, is that this system is highly time varying. We know that if you have a super spreader event, then in a few days you could have a, you know, a spike in the prevalence in a particular population, right? And so our, speaking to our epidemiologists, they were of the opinion that any data that's older than 14 days is sort of useless for predicting current prevalence. And if you combine these two things, um, you realize that you're actually not working with all that much data. Okay, so here I took two weeks of testing data as of the 1st of October. Um, on the x-axis, I'm showing, so this is a histogram in terms of the number of countries. So the y-axis is the number of countries. The x-axis is the number of tested, and then you see how many countries had this many tests in this previous two weeks. So there's only like, you know, one country out here that had more than 10,000 tests in the previous two weeks. And if you dice up this histogram, what you see is, 75% of the countries had less than 200 tested passengers in the previous two weeks, okay? So if you are thinking about this statistically, estimating a number that's on the order of one in a thousand from 200 data points is an incredibly challenging statistical task. But worse, I made this picture in the space of countries. But if you remember, like Greece's original re request was we want estimates that live at the space of subpopulations. So subpopulations could be further divided by gender, by age, by states within a country or things like this. And these are all categorical variables. You're looking at a very high dimensional feature that describes a pa passenger. And so this will further exacerbate any instability of the small data issue. Okay. Exactly. Yes, so, of course. So isn't there also a selection bias here? You're not randomly screening people, right? Yes. So uh, 100% that there is a, let me rephrase the question for the room. So I, I presented this as like, oh, you're, I, I made no statistical claim so far. You might be thinking in the back of your head, like, oh, you're seeing IID data and you have to estimate this thing. The truth is that there is a selection bias because I'm not seeing IID data. The data that I'm seeing is determined by the RL algorithm. Now, there are, it turns out that the effects of this thing in this context is second order because you're gonna be doing a lot of exploration, right? And why are you gonna be doing a lot of exploration? Because again, you have a time varying system and you have this high dimensional feature. So there is some effect here. I'm not gonna explicitly account for it. That's a great theoretical question for open work about how to think about this. But most of the existing theory in this uh, sort of suggests that the bias that's introduced is sort of second order. Um, to what else the other the other problems going on here. 
but yeah, I'm just gonna not talk about it. Cool. Okay, so for this talk, what am I gonna talk about? Um, I'm gonna focus on in this estimation piece, how do we estimate the prevalence at the country level? So this first small data issue, and I'm gonna sidestep this high dimensional feature selection problem. Okay, um, we use some heuristic for type identification based on lasso. You can take a look at the paper if you wanna see it or ask me some questions, but already just sort of estimating prevalence for each country from a data set like this is quite challenging. So I'm gonna talk about that. Okay, so again, going back to this larger uh, message for the talk, which is that I'm not really concerned as much with optimality as I am these qualitative goals. I think it bears spending a minute thinking about how are these estimates going to be used before we think about what algorithm we should use to farm them. And if you spend like five minutes thinking about this, you realize that decision makers monitor these estimates daily for trends, right? And in particular, in that qualitative goal, we had non-technical stakeholders in other parts of the Greek government looking at these estimates to inform decision making. In fact, one of the more surprising things I'll talk about later is that these estimates started being transmitted to the EU globally, right? So you had non-technical stakeholders across the continent looking at these estimates, right? And they would track them day on day. And if you're tracking an estimate day on day, stability is just as important as accuracy because if the number changes from yesterday, they're gonna ask why. So it should be that any changes that we see in the data are actually, uh, sorry, in the estimates are actually represented by material changes in the data. And what I think is, why am I stressing this, right? Is that I think what's interesting um, is that many modern machine learning methods are very unstable to minor perturbations, okay? And I think this is, a, this is a thing that's well known in machine learning, for example, for neural networks, where we've seen like, you know, everyone's seen the picture of the panda, you change one pixel and then the neural network says it's a given, or you see the stop sign and someone puts a sticker on it and now it says, now it's a yield sign. Um, but what's interesting is it's also very true in this particular small data imbalanced environment for other more stable algorithms uh, that are ensemble based. So here I'm looking at not a neural network. I'm going to look at gradient boosted machines, one of like the more popular ways of doing this. And I ran a little experiment. So the experiment is using real data as of the 1st of September. Okay. Um, country A is a randomly chosen country. Okay. Countries B through K are the 10 most risky countries as of the state. Okay. And what I did was I first just ran the GBM, used all the feature that I had access to from this um plf data to try to predict people's risk and then i have average risk levels and that's what i presented in in red here okay and then i did the following experiment i went to this country a country a remember was a randomly chosen country and i added one more positive case okay so we have thousands of arrivals from country a over the last two weeks right i added one person and i said they were sick and i refit the gbm Okay, and if you refit the GBM, what you see is that the estimates for all of these other countries are changing. And this is sometimes substantive, right? Like country A dropped in risk 85%. And you have to imagine the conversation that you would have to have here, right? So if a decision maker came to you and they said, Vishal, why is uh, country E less risky than it was yesterday? And you were like, cool, there was a one infected guy who came from a completely different country that has nothing to do with country E, and that's why the estimate dropped they would completely lose faith in the system. They'd be like, what does this mean? What is going on here that you're telling me this guy that came from, I don't know, from, from Italy, right? Suddenly means that everyone from Bulgaria is less risky than they were before, right? It's just a very strange statement. Um, this was surprising to me. I gotta say, so like uh, Hamza showed me this picture and there was a while where I was like, there's gotta be a bug, right? Um, and the reason it's surprising to me is that GBM is an ensemble method, right? The, the classical knowledge in machine learning says, oh, ensemble methods should be stable. They average things to reduce variability. That is their, 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 their job in some sense, right? And there's a setting in which stability is the fundamental idea for learning for these algorithms. But what's going on here is that the riskiest countries are often have small numbers of arrivals. And if you have a small number of arrivals for these very risky countries, right? Like not everybody is super, super sick. Only a small subset of the population is super sick, right? And you have this very imbalanced data sets these sorts of perturbations are not guaranteed by stability, right? Like stability is not going to help you do this. The type of stability GBM is satisfied is that on average numbers shouldn't change too much. But this is sort of what's going on in the tail. And this is like true of many of the ML algorithms that we were thinking about using. 
Okay, so this is not going to work. What are we going to do, right? If we want this stability property, um, and what we decided on looking at was an empirical Bayes uh, approach. Okay, so for those that might not know, this is a very common setting when you're estimating thousands of parameters simultaneously. It was sort of pioneered in microarray analysis and large scale rating systems. Um, here, we're going to think about the parameters as the prevalence in different subpopulations. Just to give you like a flavor of how this works, what would be the simplest model I could have for this system is I could say, well, I have different countries, countries A, B, C, they all have some unknown prevalence. I see data, what is the data? I test some people and the probability that um, someone tests positive is given by this unknown prevalence. Uh, and then if I were a Bayesian, what would I do? Right, a classical Bayesian would say like, okay, I don't know these unknown prevalences across the countries, but I will assume that they are drawn from some common prior distribution. Okay, and then a classical Bayesian would look deep inside their soul and they would assume some like a particular parametric form of this prior distribution. If you take it to be beta, for example, then you get nice closed form updates. Okay, what is the empirical Bayesian idea? Well, the empirical Bayesian idea says, instead of just looking in my soul and choosing a prior distribution, what I can notice is that if I look across these data sets vertically, so I compare this data set, this data set, this data set, the dispersion in these data sets is informative of this prior distribution. So for example, if this prior distribution was very concentrated around some value, I would expect these data sets to look very similar because these P's will look very similar to so these data sets should look similar. If this prior distribution was very, very dispersed, I would expect these P's to be very different and hence these data sets to look very different. So comparing vertically allows me to understand something about the prior distribution. So the key idea of these empirical Bayes methods is you look at this vertical, um, you look at the dispersion across data sets, we use a particular moment matching technique to learn about the prior. Once you fit this prior, Right, which has now been on all data from all the countries, you then think uh, horizontally and you pick a country and use this prior, use this data and do the classical Bayes update to get something about this uh, unknown prevalence. The benefits here are that like theoretically you can prove under Bayesian assumptions that you achieve optimal MSC as the number of countries grows large, right? So I'm not saying I have more than these 200 tests. I still have 200 tests, but I have a lot of countries. Um, the suboptimality dies like the number, one of the square of the number of countries. Um, it achieves this particular stability property that I won't quite define, but it doesn't have this awfulness that GBM was showing us. Um, and then practically, which I think is more important for the setting, you have a very simple closed form formula for this uh, estimator. I haven't presented it, but it's very simple. It's something that you can actually explain to an epidemiologist about what's going on. And the MSE is, is very competitive. So here I've shown the excess MSC over a particular naive estimator. Um, the prior strength you can think about as a parameter that indexes the prior distribution. Um, what I wanted to stress in this picture is that the maximum likelihood estimator, the naive thing that you would first do when you looked at this problem, has an excess MSC that's so large it doesn't fit on this graph, right? Versus our estimator has a closed form formula. It doesn't quite get the minimum MSC, but it, because, because it's a closed form formula, but it is very close. Right, so it's a very good, nice approximation. And then what I think is the other really important thing here is that if you work in this Bayesian framework, you naturally convey uncertainty, right? And so I can make graphs like this to show decision makers, where for each country I can say, this is my estimate of the risk, but it comes with this sort of confidence interval, right, where these are both Bayesian posterior credible regions. And this I think is super helpful in a reinforcement learning context, because in reinforcement learning, it might be that, for example, I want to test this country instead of this one. And you might have a decision maker that says, do, why are you wasting a test on a lower risk country? Just assign it to this one. But by being able to look at, like a, you know, I guess a better example maybe is this one, looking at these confidence regions and say, well, we don't know. Maybe the risk is actually up here, but then it's actually much more risky. And so this is part of the, the conversations you can then have. All right, I'm going to do five minutes on the reinforcement learning piece, and then we'll talk about impact. And I'll give us five minutes for questions. Any questions on how we ask this, this Bayesian model, empirical Bayesian model, I should say? Okay. So this was the question Matthew asked early, right? Which is like, how do you manage this exploration exploitation trade-off? 
And again, just to remind people what is going on here, there's an exploration piece here in that you want to test enough passengers from each type in the last two weeks to accurately estimate the risk. And you can't have them be much older than two weeks because of this non-stationarity, because risk will be changing. But then you have this exploitation piece, which is that you want to test arrivals from risky types, right, to avoid spread. So if you know this country is really risky, you want to test a lot of their tourists so that you don't import a lot of cases into the country. So you can frame this as like a multi-armed bandit problem. Um, there's, I guess, an infinite literature about multi-armed bandits, um, where the arms here you can think of as the countries, right? So passengers from country from Italy, right? Should I test someone from Italy or should I test someone from Bulgaria? Um, again, so like for this talk, think about the arms, the country of origin. In reality, the arms were something like these subpopulations. And what's the classical intuition around bandits is that you do something like UCB. So if you're comparing two countries, um, you're going to pick the one that has the highest confidence interval in some sense. You test that one. When you test him, both the mean and the confidence interval change, and then you proceed in this optimistic fashion, right? Of always looking at like, what is the worst case that could be going on here? And let me just test those people. Um, and then in this case, you would test Spain, and then I guess they shrink over time. So in this way, you reduce uncertainty, but are still testing these things. The problem is that in our model, the things are, are very far from the classical model. So one is we have non-stationary dynamics, right? So this is that two weeks of data is all I've got, right? So thinking about this asymptotically in like a T goes to infinity regime is just silly, right? That's not what we're really thinking about. The second is that there's a batch decision-making. So this comes from the ops. It turns out that with these like very remote islands, the internet connectivity was of question. So what the Greek government wanted to do was it wanted at the beginning of the day at like 12.01 a.m. to decide who was going to be tested for the whole day. So this is like pre-choosing pre all of your arms to pull for the day. This is a batched bandit. Um, there's also delayed feedback, right? Because even if I pull an arm today, I don't get to see whether this person was positive or negative until the lab gets processed, right? Which can take up to 48 hours. And then the last thing is that there's a ton of constraints here. Right, so I can't just arbitrarily say I want to test, I don't know, 1 million people at Athens if I don't have 1 million budget, like a budget of 1 million things there. Moreover, like if I'm saying I want to test Italians and Italians only come to say like, I don't know, this, uh, this particular point of entry, then somehow I have to think ahead about how I'm going to assign where I do the test for people from Italy. Um, each of these issues has sort of been studied in isolation in the bandit literature, but if you take them together, there's a whole bunch of new challenges. So I'm not going to, maybe I'll do this in questions if people want to do this, but you can sort of convince yourself that the classical bandits will fail dramatically in this setting for very obvious reasons. Um, the classical batched algorithms usually say, uh, have an explore then commit sort of strategy. These will also fail sort of dramatically in this uh, because of the non-stationarity. Right, And so what we do is we develop a new technique based on certainty equivalent updates. And rather than go into the details, what I'll say, what does this thing do? This says that um, in order to get around the delayed feedback and get around the batching, what I will assume when I'm making decisions is that when I pull an arm, what I see right before, before the actual test comes back, I'll pretend like the information that I receive is the expected information. And I'll think about pulling, applying like a naive bandit algorithm assuming that I receive expected information for each of my polls. When the tests actually come back, I'll go back and fix it and reflect the, replace that expected information with the actual poll. But doing this way um, leads to much more sensible allocations. Okay. So here in this picture, um, the x-axis is countries, the y-axis is the number of tests allocated. Um, and you can see that the allocations that you get, you're testing all of the high-risk countries um, and then for the rest of this, you're sort of doing a nice little exploration across all countries, okay? And that there are some countries where there are many untested arrivals, but those are the, um, the lower risk ones. All right, so lots of details here I didn't want to get a chance to talk about. Please come ask me or ping me. I'm happy to meet with you later. Um, what I do want to talk about in the 10 minutes I've got is sort of measured impact. So you could look at this talk and you'd be like, Michelle, all these models make no sense. Uh, this algorithm is dumb, right? And that I think that's a fair criticism. Uh, but one of the nice things we could do is since this was deployed, is we could actually talk about what was the impact. Um, and the way I'm first going to think about this is I want to compare the benefits of this system 
versus random surveillance. And why random surveillance? Because random surveillance was the initial proposal from the Greek government. And it was more or less what everybody else was doing at the time. So random surveillance means just like pick somebody out of line and test them. Okay. Um, now this is a little bit tricky because at the end of the summer, when I deployed Ava, I can just go back and count how many infections I found, right? It's just a counting exercise. But if you asked me this counterfactual question that, hey, Vishal, had you not implemented Ava, had you implemented random surveillance, I need to do some counterfactual analysis to guess how many random surveillance would have caught. Fortunately, in this setting, there's a way to do this in a model independent way. So even if you don't believe any of my estimators, any of my statistics, there is a nice unbiased model independent way to do this counterfactual analysis via um, inverse propensity weights. And that's what I've done in this picture. So the x-axis is time, this is the summer. The y-axis is the number of infections. Ava is in pink, the pink dots are just counting. And then the green dots are this unbiased estimators of what's going on with random surveillance. And you can see across the board, Ava has an advantage. There are different ways to summarize this advantage. Um, the way that I like to summarize it is if you think about the peak tourist season, so when most of the tourist arrivals are coming, uh, random surveillance identifies about half, a little more than half of the infections that Ava identifies. You could equivalently think about this as one over 54.1% and say that Ava does 1.85 times better than random surveillance or equivalently random surveillance needs 1.85 times the testing capacity to achieve the same performance. So that's substantive in my mind um, as an improvement over the baseline. But you could also say to me, Vishal, look, come on, man, like random surveillance is probably the dumbest thing you could have done. You picked a really weak straw man, so of course you crushed it. And that's a fair criticism. And so uh, the other comparison I'm gonna share with you guys today is the benefits of the infections caught versus what I'm gonna call smart surveillance. So what is smart surveillance? So at the time in the summer, countries were reporting common epidemiological matrix, right? So they would say things like, we had this many cases per million people in the last two weeks, or this many deaths, or we had this many tests, or things like this. Um, these data were publicly shared, right? Because I guess uh, this was a global need, but there's a whole host of data reliability issues. So if you ever actually look at this data, you see really interesting things. Um, like some countries will report zero deaths for a month, and then they'll report like a thousand, just as a spike, and then they'll report nothing. Or some countries will say, oh, we had 200 cases yesterday, and then today they'll report uh, minus 190 cases, you know, because they're like, oh, somebody entered in the data incorrectly. And so they're doing the correction. So this is fine, like uh, ex post, you can do all these fixes. But if you're using this information for real time decision making, this kind of reliability issues are a disaster. We like did our best to fix them. Let's pretend like uh, they don't exist. And we looked at three policies. So these policies assign testing based on. Um, the host countries reported cases per capita, deaths per capita, or positivity per capita. Um, we did the same counterfactual analysis. Again, you see AVA has an advantage. The advantage is not as large, right? These are smarter surveillance policies, um, but you see that they vary uh, substantially, right? So you still see like, I don't know, compared to cases per capita, you're seeing like a 1.45 X improvement, okay? The other thing to recognize though, is you're really gonna do these smart surveillance, it requires very similar infrastructure to, to Ava. It's not just picking somebody out of line, you actually have to know where they're from and then use real-time information about where they're from to do the testing. So from a technological capital infrastructure point of view, it's very similar. So again, I don't know, some people are very negative. You could look at this and you could also say, well, okay, these are better benchmarks, Michelle, but like maybe again, these are just the wrong policies. Maybe if I did something very clever with the public data that was available for each country, I could have designed a policy that does better than your reinforcement learning algorithm. It's hard for me to say that that's not true, right? Like maybe you could have done super, super something smart. I don't think it is true though. And so let me explain why I think it's not true. So here, what we did was we looked at a similar task. So we said, we have this ex post data from AVA where we can estimate risk. Let me just see if I can use public data to estimate if a country has a prevalence greater than uh, five in a thousand. If it's five, bigger than five in a thousand, I'll call it risky. If it's lower, I'll call it safe. And we'll say, just build the classifier that uses public data to do this. And what you see is the we did a variety of uh, models built on this. Um, most of them have AUC like close to random. Okay, say so like something like 50% accuracy. 
The exception is maybe this model five. And what is model five? Model five is like a, a model that uses um, this public information, but then also includes country level fixed effects. Okay. And country level fixed effects seem to fix the problem a little bit, not a lot. And, but what does it tell you? It means that what's going on here is that at the time, healthcare systems were so strained that the testing was very idiosyncratic. You had some countries like Switzerland who said, look, you know, um, we're going to accept that we want herd immunity. If you're older or if you're at risk group, just stay home. Young people go out. We're not testing. Get it. Get COVID. Give it to each other. Recover. We'll get herd immunity. You had countries like the U.S. where our president at the time said, you know, we're going to do less testing because the more tests you do, the more cases you find. Right. And so because of these idiosyncratic effects, the way that you interpret the number of cases, like if I say, oh, I had 10 cases last week, should be very different. If you're testing, those 10 cases are from a country where you test everybody, right? It's very different than I have 10 cases that I test like, you know, one in a billion people, right? That's a very different signal of information. And learning this difference is not possible from the data that you have, just the public data. You would need to supplement it with um, unbiased, like reinforcement learning data. So to me, the fact that these things uh, fail, right, is a good signal for the reinforcement learning. There's another sort of subtle thing going on here, which is that these public level numbers of like how many cases did you see, how many deaths, these represent the general population. But in some sense for AVA, we don't care about the general population from a country like Great Britain. We care about the traveler population and the asymptomatic traveler population. And if you look at the data, you can see things like these are people that are systematically younger, they're systematically more wealthy, they're systematically uh, more risk-taking than the general population, because they're the people that are willing to put their life at risk to go to Greece for a summer vacation in the middle of a pandemic, right? So this is, this is who they are. So somehow these, this number that you're seeing in the public data is perhaps too noisy, right? And there is some value to reinforcement learning in this setting, not just machine learning. Okay, last two minutes. Uh, so I mentioned these quantitative goals. I've given you some measurement of these impact of these quantitative goals, but I also said, look, there are qualitative goals here about informing decision makers. And rather than me just telling you that we did a good job, um, I'm going to pass the baton to our co-author, uh, Dr. Siodris. You can think of him as the Greek version of Anthony Fauci. Hi, I'm Professor Siodras. I teach internal medicine and infectious disease at the University of Athens Medical School. I also serve as a member of the Scientific Advisory Forum of the European Centers for Disease Control, and I'm the president of the Greek Infectious Disease Society. Over the last 18 months, I serve as the chief scientific advisor to the Greek government with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic response. Speaking about EVA, I would like to emphasize that while there were many ad hoc approaches for travel protocols, implemented across the world during the summer of 2020, ours was one of the few purely data-driven approaches. Prevalence estimates from this novel reinforcement learning system were used to inform within-country operations and significant public health actions, including relocating mobile testing resources and targeting tourists visiting Greece from countries classified by EVA as high risk and, of course, guided contact tracing activities. Greece communicated EVA's prevalence estimates centrally to other European countries in order to inform and shape travel policies across the continent. I think EVA is proof of the importance of a data-driven culture when devising strategies to respond to pandemic-related challenges. And EVA's prototype approach will be useful not only in facing the current pandemic, but also in preparation for facing future pandemics. Okay, so this last piece, I think, is something that was surprising to us. It was not conceived of when we started the project. Um, but it turned out because we were the only people that were doing mass testing of travelers, Greece was the only place where you could get this sort of un, uh, unadulterated uh, uh, signal about how noisy these asymptomatic traveler populations were. So this information started being spread upward to the EU um, and to the ECDC uh, to inform policy. All right, so I'm um, over time, any questions?
So if you're interested in the algorithmic details and some of the epidemiological implications, I refer you to our nature paper on that first paper. If you're more interested in some of the system design choices that were going on here for, for Eva and how we thought about them, um, there's a second paper that's appeared in Informed Journal of Applied Analytics, formerly named Interfaces. You can get both of them on my website. Um, and I just want to conclude with a thank you. Um, there's no way that you ever do a project of this size single-handedly. You need a ton of collaborators to get something off the ground. So first, I've already mentioned my great co-author is Hamsan Kimon. Uh, John is a software developer that helped work on designing some of the backend databases. Special thank you to the COVID-19 Executive Committee of Greece. Um, and then the COVID-19 Scientific Task Force, who are all our fantastic epidemiological physician co-authors that taught us about a lot of the insides and outsides. All right. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take whatever questions people have. Okay, so maybe I'll start with a few questions. Um, I'm really um, intrigued by this, this work. Um, so the so first question, uh, so my question, a little bit detailed about the modeling, the, the part you, yeah, you skipped. Um, um, so um, so what, in this reinforcement learning um, framework, so is that more considered as an online learning or offline learning problem? So my guess would be online learning. And, uh, and then uh, when you develop the model, how do you validate your model? Um, because I assume this system will be deployed in the real world and because the, when the new data trickle in, you can update your estimates, right? But uh, when you don't have that incoming data yet, then how do you validate your model? Um, yeah, so if I understood the question, so first I agree, it's online learning. Think of it like uh, multi arm embedded on steroids, right? That's a good, that's a good way to think about it. Um, and if I understood the question, the question was, how do you think about validation? So I agree with you that like post facto, if you get people to buy, buy this, then you can do the, the counterfactual analysis I showed you as validation that you're doing something intelligent, right? That like whether or not you believe any of the internal workings of the model, the outputs are doing something intelligent. But I think your question was upfront. Yes. How do you decide? Before um, you convince them, you need to show that, okay, in some way this is gonna work. But at yeah. that time, you don't have the incoming data yet. So how do 100%. you make that case? Exactly, yeah. So I think there was two things going on here. So one thing that we did not lean as much on, we did some of, but not a lot of, was thinking about simulation. So you can like postulate ground truth models of what's going on here, run the algorithm in simulation against these ground truth models, and then assess, like, is it doing something smart? We did some of this, but not a lot. And I think that... Um, Part of the reason we did some of this and not a lot is that's only convincing if you really believe the ground truth model. And then it's a very hard thing to explain to non-technical people, right? Yeah. So the thing that we tended to do more was that we really focused on models that were inherently and obviously simple and correct. So like that empirical Bayes model, I think, is a good example. I didn't write down the formula, uh, but what is the formula for how it computes estimates? You can think of the formula for how it computes estimates as a weighted combination of two things. One thing is the maximum likelihood estimate for the country. And the other thing is the average prevalence across all countries. Mm. So what it says, and it's, and it's weighted in a way where the more data you have for this country, the less weight is on this, this global mean, right? And so what you get is that for countries where you have lots of data, you just get the maximum likelihood estimate and we know that works well. For countries yeah. where you have not so much data, right? You sort of say, okay, well, I don't know a lot about it, but it's gotta look like a typical country. And so I'll estimate in this way. So having simple models, I think is part of the way in which you can justify that what you're doing here is, is hopefully sensible. But yeah, up until it's done, I don't think, there was a lot of stress for the first, for first week looking at the allocations that were coming out and being like, do the allocations make sense? Should we readjust the algorithm? Should we tune some things, things like that. For a lot of late night wake ups at 12 a.m. Greek time. <laughs> well, thanks, that, that's really, really interesting. Um, yeah, my, my second question um, about the non-stationarity, right? So um, I think that's, that's opens, like, I shouldn't say opens a can of the worms, but the, um, I think that opens a lot of flexibilities in how you assume about the like, dynamic structures, right? Because the whole point of this, um, this estimation, um, other than the standard multi unbanded is that things are changing. You have a moving target to shoot. Um, so do you assume any structures on this? Time no, dynamics? So, 
or is uh, it purely empirical or para non parametric? Or? Yeah, great question. So I think we take a non parametric perspective, right? Um, and so we just say like data from the last two weeks is close enough to today that it's useful, right? There are so many people in the multi arm bandit literature that use like exponential smoothing. So they'll say like past data, I'm going to down weight in the algorithm um, in some way. This, I think both of these methods are very similar and they're both non-parametric and that I'm not really saying anything about the trajectory, okay? We can contrast these two. I think there have been other methods that will say, well, I believe that the prevalence is gonna ask, like it's gonna evolve according to this SIR model. Right. And given yeah. that I know it's gonna evolve in this SIR model, then I can try to learn the parameters of this SIR model and then like do something clever because I know, you know, if it's going up, I know yes. where it'll be tomorrow, yeah. right? Um, and I think that this is a moment where we said, look, look, looking at the data, none of these these models fit in a convincing way, okay. right? That like uh, are really working here. And so what you could do instead of doing more clever modeling about projecting what's going to happen tomorrow is work harder on making that loop fast. And so if you're reacting in real time to this loop, then like doing clever projection isn't as a, like a uh, clever prediction far into the future isn't necessary because you're reacting quickly. So this is a, again, I think where that ML and the OR fit together, right? We can't solve this ML problem, so like make the OR stronger. You don't have to worry about it as much. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, because if you assume it's SIR model, that's actual assumptions. You then you have to um, to justify that actually fits the data, and that's um, just different perspective, right? So and um, yeah, and I think like yeah. in this in this uh, popular like this setting, what you see is these spikes, right? Like you see like there was a super spreader event, that there's a spike. Yeah. And then it goes back to normal and then it spikes again later. This is not SIR behavior. No, no. Right. So like it's um I think that it's it was would be hard to buy into one of those compartmental models. Thanks. Yeah, this is really, really exciting. Of course, yeah. Yeah, it seems that our time is up. Uh thank you so much, Michelle. Of course. Your, thank you for the thank you very much for the invitation. I enjoyed this. If anyone in the audience has questions and want to reach out, please just ping me by email. I'm happy to help. Great. Thank All you, right. everyone. Thank you. Bye.